Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Hi, I'm Megan Collins, author of The Family Plot, and you're enjoying The Thriller Zone with David Temple. Well, we are here today with Megan Collins, and it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for having me here. I was reading part of your press release, and I kind of feel like that the Thriller Zone is part of the kickoff of your virtual tour. And I see that you've got August 17th for uh, the kickoff on One Club, another uh, Savoy Bookshop, Murder by the Book. And I'm like, I'm not on there. Why? So... (laughs) I thought (laughs) as we're kicking off, I feel like we're starting you. Yes, definitely. This is my first like legit event. (laughs) Yeah. As the, everyone sees the photo behind you, the the book behind you, this is, first of all, this is a beautiful, beautiful cover. Oh, thank you. I love it. I'm so obsessed with it. (laughs) I got really lucky. You know, it is, it is magic, isn't it? When you find a designer or, or um, a publisher who really gets it. Yeah. And create something that's so, when I first saw it, I'll be honest, I'm like, oh, that's nice. It's a cute little, ha- oh, it's in a, oh, there's somebody in the, you know, it's one of those things that pulls you in step by step. Yeah. And of course, we're talking about The Family Plot, which is your third book. First, The Winter Sister, Behind the Red Door, and now The Family yeah. Plot, which drops in just a couple of days. Uh, how, how do I start off? I try to think of like singular words that really work. Heroine disturbing definitely <laughs> palm sweating and uh of course the the line that kicks off everything for me they love true crime until they're at the center of one mm-hmm. thank you tell yeah. me where this plot of the family plot came from well usually it, it came a little backwards for me because um usually I get an idea in my head, sort of a what if question that just starts to fascinate me for a while. Like for my last book, Behind the Red Door, the question was, what if someone who was famously kidnapped as a child then went missing again as an adult and what would happen? So from there, the story started to kind of unpeel and show itself to me. But for the family plot, it actually started with the title. I was working on something else. I could not figure out a title. We were ready to submit it to my publisher, basically. I had all my sample materials ready and I just needed a title for it. And so I was talking to my husband and I was asking him for some suggestions. And I said, I want something that speaks to the family aspect of the book because families are already always a big part of my books. And um, so he just like throws out there oh, the family plot. And I was like, no, that doesn't work for this at all, but that's a great title. And so, because right away in my head, I was like, okay, well, you have a family plot. So you have dead bodies, you have graves. There's already a thriller vibe right there, but also there's the double meaning of plot in the word um, so that it could be the family's plot, the pl- family is plotting perhaps. Um, so I loved that. And, and that phrase that title just kept going through my head for a few days while I was trying to work on this other thing and still title this other thing and then I remember I was just getting ready one morning and I really can't explain it other than it just popped into my head okay there's this family they're going to bury their father 
but then they dig up his spot in the burial plot and they find a body already there. And I was like, ah, <laughs> and I was obsessed with that right away. I remember I ran into the bathroom where my husband was like brushing his teeth and I'm like, listen to this. And he was like, okay, yep, that's very dark. <laughs> um, and then, so I was like, okay, who's in the grave? Who did they find? Well, it's gotta be somebody connected to them so that it, it resonates, it means something. So I was like, okay, what if it's a member of their family who went missing years ago, um, which in the case of the book is that they thought this, person ran away and so um so that kind of came in and I'm like okay well they're there burying their father they find him well what is this family like and I was like well wouldn't it be interesting if you know who would be who would be the most interesting type of family to have this happen to it would be a family that maybe is already really steeped in the language of murder and crime and all of that because this family has a very unusual upbringing um, in that their mother homeschooled them and included in her homeschool curriculum all these true crime stories. So the children, as young as, I mean, in the, in the very first sentence, you learn that the narrator learned um, her namesake, which is, her name's Dahlia, and she was named after the Black Dahlia. She learned the story of the Black Dahlia, which is this brutal crime story um, at four years old. So this has been steeped in their whole life, their lifestyle, their upbringing. And um, so I thought, what, what would it be like for that kind of family that's been around that their whole life, that's been fascinated in, uh, with true crime to suddenly become a true crime story themselves? And, and where does it go from there? So that's, that's how the story kind of spun out for me. Um, but yeah, it all really originated with the title. And so I have my husband to thank, I guess, for the whole book. <laughs> Golf clap to hubby. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. And the story is uh, multi-layered. You don't, you don't see so many things coming. And that's one of the things I really liked about it was, uh, and without giving anything away, you just about think you've got it, which is one of my favorite kind of stories. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling pretty confident. <laughs> and then uh, a piece of the onion gets peeled back and you're like, oh, uh, okay. And then another one and you and it just keeps going until wow. And it does take a while. It's, it's a, I call it a slow simmer. Mm -hmm. So it's like you put something on the oven and you just let it simmer. And then all of a sudden you turn the heat up a little bit and it starts boiling. That was the family plot. And I, I loved it. Thank you so much. And I'm just as a little bit of background, because, you know, I talked to so many authors there, you know, especially with thrillers, they're former military, they're former cops, they're former detectives, they're former fill in the blank. Very few so far uh, are former BA English uh, teachers, Wheaton College, MFA in creative writing, Boston University. You've taught at both Greater Hartford Academy of Arts and Central Connecticut State University. So I'm like, this gal knows what she's talking about and knows about the craft. When you were doing the education, was writing has writing always been that dream from way back when that says, I just have to do this, I can't do anything else? Yeah, it was exactly like that. I've never, I've never envisioned any other kind of career path. Um, and the reason I actually got into teaching was because, um, which I did love, I loved teaching. Um, and this is actually the first year in 12 or 13 that I haven't taught. I've just been writing this year, but um, wow. I got into that because for my MFA program, um, part of it, part of my scholarship was I had to teach a class, a creative writing class. And I was terrified because I was somebody who was very like scared of public speaking and anything like that. So I thought it was gonna be horrible, but the first day, I loved that too. So I kind of then was like, okay, well, I want to, I want to teach and I'll write during the summers and I'll, and it'll be like a great pairing. Um, and so I did, I did do that for um, 12 years and it really was amazing. Um, and it was a way to like leave my desk after I finished writing, go to work and still be immersed in the world of writing and language and craft and all of that. But yeah, for the most part, my whole life, I was just like, I just wanna be a writer. I don't wanna do anything else. And I'm really lucky um, because I saw this actually with a lot of my creative writing students was that they, they would have parents who would be like, okay, yeah, you're a good writer, but what are you gonna do that's practical? What are you gonna do that's gonna help you pay the bills? And I never got that message from my parents. They they really always supported me and were just like, well, yeah, you love writing. Like you should 
you should do this. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's worked out so far, luckily. So, so, but I'm just really grateful that I didn't have that voice being like, no, you've got to go learn biology or something you're not interested right. in just so you have something else. So yeah, it's pretty much always been this. And then luckily I was able to fall in love with teaching too. What a gift. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, I was thinking the other day, like, I guess it's probably not, not that many people that stick with one thing their whole life that they want to do and then actually get to say, oh, I'm living my dream. And sometimes when you're in the day to day of writing, you kind of forget that because writing is hard and it's not always just really fun and magical. So, but I like to kind of sit back sometimes and think, okay, no, like you're doing the thing you wanted to do since you were six years old. Like, even if writing's hard, like it's, it's a great problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious because you're talking about teaching and writing at the same time. Are you still managing editor? What is it? Three elements review? Yep. Yep. So that's another thing that I do. And um, that's another place. Uh, it's kind of like just another way where I get to still be involved with language, but this time it's, um, well, I guess, this is the same with teaching, nurturing other writers and um, making space for other writers, which is really important to me. Um, so yeah, I do that too. I love that. I'm, I was sitting there thinking about your different characters. Um, Dahlia, of course, as you mentioned, by the way, side note, I loved, I always have wondered and have been fascinated by that Black Dahlia story yeah. and how gruesome it is. And correct me if I'm wrong, they never found the killer, right? No, I mean, I think that there's, I don't think that there's a definitive answer. Um, I think that a lot of people have theories and there's been tons of books about it, but there hasn't been one like, yes, this is a fact and we know it for sure. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the characters. Uh, Mom, of course, was, which is her own uh, version of Whack Job. Uh, Tate, my favorite is probably Charlie. I just find my him. My favorite. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, oh, I kept, you know, I, I kept seeing different actors playing him in the movie uh, because it's always a movie in my head. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, what a juicy role that, that sarcastic, flamboyant, uh, disrespectful. He, he was just chewy is the best word I can think of. But back to Dahlia Lighthouse, what, from what tormented dream did she come? <laughs> <laughs> well, so when I started thinking of who is going to lead this story, mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to do in writing this book was exploring, uh, you know, what does, because so many people have a fascination these days and forever, I guess, um, with true crime. Um, but I think it seems more accessible than ever with all the podcasts and the documentaries and the books and all of that. Um, so I wanted to really look at, okay, well, why is there that fascination? What does it do for us? How can it possibly help us? And in other ways, how might it hurt us to really saturate ourselves with true crime? Right. So I wanted um, Dahlia, in a way, each character is kind of a, their own answer to that question. But for Dahlia, I wanted her to be kind of representative of something I've experienced from so much true crime, which is that once you hear all these stories about all the different ways that people can be murdered or hurt or whatever, it's really hard to trust anybody or anything. It's hard. Like, I always joke about this, but it's, it's actually true. Whenever my doorbell rings and I'm not expecting someone, I'm like, I'm not getting that. That's a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, I don't think murderers are so polite that they would ring, ring the your doorbell. doorbell. And I'm like, that's exactly how they do it. They want to get my defenses down. But so I wanted Dahlia to represent that kind of worldview of not trusting anybody or anything. But the one person in her whole life that she did trust was her twin brother, Andy, who's the one that they discover was murdered. Um, and so now she's, they always thought, the family always thought, that he had run away because there was this note that was left that sounded like a runaway note which mm -hmm. then they're like okay i think the killer made planted that there but um so for the past 10 years since he supposedly ran away dahlia has been devoting her life to just searching for him and not physically going out in the world because she actually stays pretty close to the island where she grew up so that if he ever comes back she could get back there really quickly. So she searches online for him all the time to the point where she doesn't really have, she has like one friend and no other like life really. So um, 
so yeah, so that's her character to me, someone who is so singularly focused on this one person, which yes, it's her twin and yes, it would be devastating to lose them, but it's also not, it's not healthy to have just that one person you're so dependent on. Um, and so I really saw that as being the effect that this lifestyle would have had on her. Yeah, I did find it a little twisted that she was, obsession is the best word that comes to my mind, just obsessed with her brother. And even though he isn't uh, available in the story very uh, much, I feel like for however you did this, I feel like he's right there practically in every scene. I mean, okay. for some reason, it's it's palpable that he is there and yet he isn't. Great, thank you. That was actually um, something I was worried about when I was writing, I think, because, because he's such a big part of Dahlia's life, I wanted him to still feel vivid. And, and I kind of, I had that issue, I guess I had that challenge in my first novel, The Winter Sister, where there's a, a character who's basically dead the whole time, but is such a big part. And um, so something I'm really interested in is how we sort of mythologize the dead and how we how we make them better than they were once, once uh, they are gone. And um, Dahlia certainly does some of that. So there's kind of this rose colored tint to her relationship with Andy that she remembers. So yeah, I definitely tried really hard to get that in um, without, you know, it, it's, it's a little hard to do because he's never actually there on the page. He has, he's only there through the lens of her. Well, and, and again, to the point to, to give you some uh, props there is I, 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 it was as though I could hear him in the room practically. So I don't know if that's my overactive imagination or your mission was accomplished because he was there. <laughs> Either way, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you don't care how it happens, just that yeah. it happens. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of that, to say the family it is dysfunctional, I use air quotes, and that is not a spoiler. Uh, that's going to be an understatement. But do you find yourself drawn to families who are rough around the edges? And the reason I ask that is your debut novel, as you mentioned, The Winter Sister, your lead character returns home to care for her mother, making for a an uncomfortable reunion, then mm -hmm. follow up behind the red door, your lead character, once again, returns home to help her father pack for a move. And so I wonder, there's two questions that pops into my mind. Do you find yourself drawn to families really rough around the edges? Actually, I'm gonna make it three. Did your family have rough around the edges? And number three, will the next story have more rough around the edges? <laughs> yeah, I do. I It was when I was coming up with the story for the family plot and I thought, okay, so this girl, this woman returns home and I was like, hmm, they always return home to their childhood home in my yeah. books. Um, but I think, and actually, so I made an effort that in the one I'm working on now, the next one that's gonna come out, um, that's that's not a thing that happens there in their home and don't return anywhere necessarily. But, but yeah, I'm so endlessly fascinated with um, family dynamics. And I mean, like my family, I think every family is a, its own version of messed up or messy or whatever. Right. But for the most part, like I had a, I had a happy childhood, you know, I had my things that I went through, but um, so does everybody. And so, but one thing that I'm really interested in is, um, and I've talked about this with my last two books is the idea of the bad parent or the bad parents. Um, and you could argue whether or not um, Lorraine Lighthouse, who we see in this book, is a bad parent. I mean, she's definitely <laughs> got some stuff going on. Um, Bad's in the attic. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but because I think that there's such a pressure um, on, I'm not even a parent, but I think there's such a pressure in our society on parents to be perfect, to do this, do that, whatever, and hit these certain uh, marks with your kids or whatever that means and um, raise them a certain way. And so I'm really interested in what happens when somebody veers away mm -hmm. from that and is definitely not perfect and is maybe a little bit bad or a lot bad. Um, and I don't know why, I don't know what that says about me that, that I'm really fascinated by that, but that keeps, that keeps being a theme that comes up in my work. And I think um, my work also like deals a lot with um, the legacy of trauma, childhood trauma a lot and how that manifests in adulthood and what that means and what it takes to kind of go back to something and really get at the root causes of something you've tried to brush over for a lot of parts of your life. Um, mm -hmm. 
So for me, that's all intertwined with family. And, and yeah, I just, I love making these rough, messy families. Um, it's really fun for me. And in fact, a huge challenge of the book that I'm writing now for me is that to, at the start, the family is not messy at all. They seem like this really great family. And then I go in and I really mess them up. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that's actually a big challenge. I'm like, oh, they're not like having, at least at the start they're not having all this tension and weirdness and discomfort like they love each other and it's just great um but but yeah so i i love messy families i love dysfunctional families sure. i think there's endless possibilities for those stories well and if it was all happy roses unicorns and rainbows then uh would anybody really sit down to read it you right. know and uh, plus, we love seeing, I used the phrase rough around the edges, and I did that as about as softly as I could, because it really translates to effed up or uh, mm -hmm. screwballed or dysfunctional. Um, and I, back to the mother, and let's see if I can do this as delicately as possible without giving it away. And if I do mm -hmm. give it away, then I will cut it out. So I love the fact that back to the thing that the kids grew up, they love, they're fascinated and absorbed, uh, obsessed rather with true crime. And it's a lot because of the mother's homeschooling. So then later, much later, you find out that some of those facts weren't quite the same, which has led them to build, not only build who they were upon that story, but now you're seeing them crash on the mental rocks mm -hmm. with the reality of what they thought was one thing was indeed not that. Yeah. Is that enough suspense to make people want to go buy it and not give it away? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the mother definitely has a secret. And as you go through the story, you're going to be like, these people all have secrets. These people are all like hiding something or at least up to something or yeah. they're just they're they're a little unhinged. <laughs> yeah, unhinged is good. And that's exactly a great tee up for my next question was, do you think that every family, this might be painfully obvious, do you think every family hides some sort of dark secret? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. I'm, like now, I'm going through my my like family photo albums in my head. Like, where's mm -hmm. our dark secret? Um, I think there are those things that every family talks about in sort of a coded language, or um, doesn't talk about a lot. Um, and it's not necessarily a secret. It could be like a really strained relationship, a really uncomfortable relationship within a family that people kind of veer around or try to make space for. Um, but yeah, I think every family has something that is something that we don't talk about a lot or, yeah. um, or then, you know, it'd be interesting if you have a family and like, that's all they talk about. And they're like, yeah. let us just air our dirty laundry in front of everybody and make everyone uncomfortable. <laughs> I noticed that of course, obviously, your th three books so far are standalones. Do you find yourself tempted or has your editor, publisher, agent come along and said, you know what, this would make a great series? Or do you have any ideas, Megan, for a series? Um, I, I haven't. I think it's so intimidating to me to think that far ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I have had readers say that they um, wish they knew what happened next with the characters and and they say well is it this that happens or is it that that happens and because on my first two books they weren't ambiguous endings at all they were they were the mysteries were solved um but there were certainly things at the end that were left a little bit open-ended and um and i definitely get questions about those and they're like is there a sequel and i kind of am of the mind that once i leave like once i finish writing the book like my mm -hmm. part in that world is done and um and people will say well what what is sylvie doing two years later and i'm like i don't know i have no idea uh, i hope she's okay um but to me it's like really up for the readers to i always say whatever you want to happen next for them like that's that's the answer that's what happens so i don't tend to think in terms of sequels i think if the right story came along that asked for that i'd definitely be open um to it but everything that i write kind of has I, I start with my characters that have some problem. I scramble them up, mess them up real good. And then I try to get them to a place where they've grown in a way that will prepare them better out in the world. So um, for me, there hasn't really been a space to take that further. 
That's a healthy way to look at it. And and one thing I give you credit for at the end of this book, and I'm I'm with you. I'm not a huge fan of people who make, especially in movies, they tie everything up in this perfect little bow, and everybody goes off and learns this lesson and improves and stops drinking and gets out of jail. And and you had a really nice, kind of gentle way to put a soft bow on your story. And I like that. And 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 it gives the reader, give the reader some credit to much as they create the world in their mind, let them decide in their own way how right. the story ends. Yeah, I, I like that term, a soft bow. I think that's definitely what I'm always doing with my stories is I tie it up, but not too tightly. And there's still room to think about what would happen next with these characters. And and um, and yeah, all their problems in my books never get completely solved. But the big thing, the big thing they need to learn or do or confront in themselves, that's always um, kind of taken care of. It's clear uh, as I was reading this that you understand detective work, that it's not cookie cutter detective work to you. And I, I was just curious, in one of your fantasy daydreams, did you ever fancy yourself a detective or do you find that your craftsmanship of writing is your own sort of inner detective? That's a really great question. I don't think, I don't think I ever wanted to be a detective necessarily. Um, mostly because as much as I do love true crime and I'm interested in it, I think I would never sleep again if I had to be someone who actually goes to the scenes and sees all these things. Um, but I think that in terms of like an inner detective, um, all of my books and writing in general for me is about articulating for myself how I feel about certain things and, and kind of, I think, I always think I know and then I find more along the way. Um, so in a very like metaphorical sense, I am sort of always the detective of my own like emotional terrain, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd make a very good detective. I think the first sign of any like emergency situation, I'd be like, nope, I'm out of here. You guys, you guys take it. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I watch, uh, uh, my wife and I watch a whole lot of detective stories and we watched one recently called Unforgotten on PBS. And the character, the lead character, the, the detective was saying that uh, she just got, as you would imagine, 20 years of seeing death and destruction and not solving some crimes and uh, how it just really hurt her. And I often find, I often think to myself, how do these detectives see that dark underbelly all their lives over and over and over and not go home affected? You'll hear some say, oh, I, I hang it on the door outside as I enter my home and, and it's gone. But I would challenge, I would beg to differ. I mean, to be able to compartmentalize that would be tough, don't you think? Yeah. And you know, as you're talking about that, it reminds me a lot of teaching and not to say that being a teacher is the same as a detective because it's right. not but um especially the place where I taught it was it's a um it's an arts high school so all the people there are studying a different art form or studying many art forms and um because of that and because of the population that we have we have a lot of emotions right at the surface and a lot of people who came to us with a lot of trauma and just situations that you know, I'm not, I'm not trained to handle, but they come up in the classroom. And so there, you know, when you were saying that thing about the detectives who the cases weigh on them that they weren't able to solve or the people they weren't able to help. I think the same is true of teachers too, that like you try to help every student you can, you try to push every student you can to be where they need to be. Um, but there are some that, you know, are sort of beyond your reach or your capabilities or, or whatever life just gets in the way and, and you don't. And I, and I know that I would always say that I wish I had a job that when I came home, I could just, it was at work still, but I always took that home with me and always continued thinking about my students and how can I, how can I reach them better? How can I help them more? Um, what can I do to make that person feel more comfortable in the classroom, whatever it is. So, so yeah, I never thought of this before, but I feel like there's a connection there. 
Yeah. And I want to give you some kudos because you're a teacher and you've been a teacher and I, I have such a deep and profound respect for teachers. I, I can literally flash back right now and remember and name every single teacher from first grade to senior year. I'm sure everyone can do that. But my point is, I remember one in particular, fourth grade, Mrs. Powell, she had such a profound impact on me in so many different ways. And uh, to this day, I think about her and I think about lessons that I've learned. And my point to that is, I think it's such an admirable and uh, ginormous, and there's a real word, uh, <laughs> uh, profession to be in and such a responsibility and teachers should never take it lightly. And often I think it's interesting and you, you touched on something is that you're able to be a voice to them that the parents aren't. They're looking at you not only as a teacher, but you may be teaching even on a subconscious level, something that they need to learn that they wouldn't listen to dad or mom at home, but they'll listen to you. So applause to you. Yeah. I mean, thank you. And I agree about teachers. I think teachers are incredible and so necessary. And, um, you know, I wish we, I, I feel like we have so many policies and, and just structures that kind of get in the way of teachers being able to actually, uh, do the work that they want to do a lot of times. Um, but yeah, I think teachers are one of the most under appreciated, um, professions, uh, and I, and I definitely, I think that was definitely, um, became clear, extra clear, I think in the pandemic when suddenly parents were having to teach their kids and it oh, was yeah. like, oh, this, this is really hard. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't, I was teaching a little bit during the pandemic cause I, uh, you know, it started in obviously March of 2020 and I was still teaching then. And so we were doing like zoom and stuff, but everybody who I wasn't teaching this past year with the really full brunt of it. And I just like, I, I just admire everybody who did that and who showed up every day, even though it was scary and hard and mm -hmm. crazy and you never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say to the parents, not as easy as you thought it was, is it? <laughs> Your kid's not always just a little ray of sunshine. <laughs> yeah. You think they're an angel. We get to see the devil at work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Who are some of the authors and it could be actors, actresses, it could be, but I'm, I'm really thinking about authors because we're talking about writing. Who's someone that you really look up to that you admire tremendously? Oh, uh, I mean, there's so many, but um, in terms of mystery writers, uh, Tana French is a huge uh, inspiration for me. Her Dublin Murder Squad series is just amazing. Um, I mean, amazing doesn't even cover it. Um, Gillian Flynn, uh, she's, I, I heard last night, she's finally working on her fourth novel after Gone Girl. So maybe we'll get something new from her in the next couple of years. Um, and th she's unfortunately, next one I'm going to say no longer with us, but Toni Morrison was always a huge inspiration for me. And, um, I don't think I've mentioned yet, but my, a lot of my background in writing is actually in poetry. My MFA was in poetry writing. Oh. And so, um, and, and starting in high school, I started really writing poetry and then fell in love with that. And so Toni Morrison as a writer was the first one that really modeled for me that you can have a really compelling story with these amazing characters and, um, and, and just like people wanting to turn the pages, but you don't have to sacrifice language or um, the sound of it or the craft of it. And you can marry those and make both of them better as a result. Um, and she, uh, I feel like nobody did that better than Toni Morrison. Beloved yeah. is one of my all time favorite books. And um, and yeah, so, so I think Toni Morrison, Gillian Flynn, Tana French, huge inspirations for me. If you weren't a writer, what do you suppose you'd be doing? I mean, I really can't envision myself doing something that didn't in some way have to do with books um, or stories. I used to really want to, in a very vague, not actually having any skills in this area way, um, make movie trailers because I just, I love, I think movie trailers are their own wonderful art form oh yeah to, to condense a story 
down to two minutes with the music that makes like sometimes gives you chills with the little um, taglines or whatever, getting the right shots in. And then of course, you're actually not telling the whole story. You're just giving them the teaser. I think it's um, just such an intricate, amazing art form. And I always like wondered what that was like to do it. I don't have any computer technology editing skills whatsoever, but maybe that's some way I would have gone. And I, I don't, I don't know if there's anybody who their job is just to make movie trailers, but it's probably like a larger, uh, editing or production thing, but that's something it, that interests me. Yeah, it is an art form and having made a movie and then handing the movie over to a friend of mine and said, here, make the most dynamic 90 seconds of juiciness that you possibly can compiling my two hour movie. <laughs> and and they and they do it. And it is an amazing thing. It's kind of like I thought about uh, uh, Ted Bell last week's uh, Thriller Zone guest. And he used to be in advertising and he and I were chatting and talking about how the, his favorite thing is to create this entire world inside of 60 seconds to mm. start the story, pull you in, grab you by the neck or the heart or the tears or the mind and then wrap it up in 60. So I'm with you. It's that that would be an amazing. Can you imagine doing that all day long? That would be great, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. It would also, I imagine, be very tedious finding the right shot in the right sure. moment and all of that. But, and I think maybe like there's sort of a, a tie between like my writing instincts and my, um, and, and that fascination for me, mm -hmm. because um, like you said, like you, with these movie trailers, you establish something right away, something that's going to hook somebody to keep watching the rest of the 90 seconds. Cause we have such ways now to just be like, no, skip doing something else. And so for me in writing, like that opening paragraph, that first line is always so important. And when I read books, I can be like super interested in the premise, but if the first line doesn't really grab me, a lot of times I'll just put it down. So like, I work really hard on opening lines and, and like obsess over them to a degree that maybe <laughs> is a bit too much. Um, but now I'm thinking maybe there's a connection there between my interest in those things. Well, and you know, a couple things, our attention spans have gotten increasingly shorter with the decades. Yeah. And I, I've talked to many writers and you know, do you remember the days that you'd sit down and read 400, 500, six, 700 pages. And now that seems so incredibly daunting. Now you're, yeah. you'll find yourself going, can I go 320? Can I go mm -hmm. 280? And I wonder if our attention spans is driving some of that business. Do you think? Yeah, I do. I mean, media is becoming like more and more bite-sized, I think, you know, and like even just with social media, like uh, the tweets are only a certain length. Uh, TikTok videos, you can't have one that's too long or somebody's going to move on. I definitely think that's true. And that we also have this thing in us now that we want to be seeing many things at once. I'll find sometimes that, you know, I'm watching TV but I'm also scrolling through my phone and I'm not really paying super hard attention to either of them. And then it's hard for me at night when my phone is near me to really like get soaked into a book because if the phone dings, I pick it up just to look at what it was. And then my hands just naturally go like to Twitter or Instagram. So I'm always, I always like when I actually like go to bed, put my phone on the charger and then start reading for a bit because it's like off. I'm not going to know anything that happens because yeah, like my, my attention span, I mean, I like read a lot, but even yeah. still, it's just, I don't know. It's like, if, if the screen isn't moving or if, you know, I can't just go, 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 go. Um, it's hard to stay in one place now. And, and it is kind of a shame because you know, that's the pleasure of reading a book that you're really immersing yourself into a place and a time and a situation for 250, 300, whatever pages. Um, and it's not meant to be something that changes very rapidly. It's sort of this slow arc over the whole thing. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Here's what I want to do. I want to take a really short break, but when we come back, I want to read, because I want to go back to something you just said about opening lines and about how crucial it is to catch and capture the attention of the readers. So when we come back, I'm going to read the opening line to the book. 
Okay. When a family obsessed with true crime gathers to bury their patriarch, horrifying secrets are exposed upon the discovery of another body in his grave. From the author of Behind the Red Door and The Winter Sister comes a haunting and suspenseful tale filled with secrets that won't remain buried. The Family Plot by Megan Collins, coming August 17th. And we're back. I'm with Megan Collins, and I want to take a second. Is it okay if I read the opening line to Family Please. Plot? Yeah. I love this. It's, it goes right back to what you were saying before the break about how, how essential it is to grab you by the beginning. So line one, my parents named me Dahlia after the Black Dahlia, that actress whose body was cleaved in half, left in grass as sharp as, scar as scapels, a permanent smile sliced onto her face. And when I first learned her story at four years old, I assumed a knife would only one day carve me up. Pretty dark. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy. <laughs> if that doesn't make you turn the page, then I, I'm not really sure what would. Or it will immediately make you be like, this book is not for me. I'm going to go read something a little lighter. <laughs> <laughs> this thing that Amos Oz says has said has always stuck with me, which is that he said the beginning of a book or story is the contract between the writer and the reader where you basically lay out, this is what the story is gonna be like. This is the tone, this is the mood, this is your expectation. Um, and that really resonated with me because that's exactly what I said, like, even if I'm intrigued by a premise, if I look at the first line and I'm not that into it, I often will just put that book aside and not get it um, because I'm like, okay, well, I'm not feeling that contract, so to speak. Like the tone isn't grabbing me, the image isn't grabbing me, whatever it is. So. Um, with my books, I try uh, with the openings to really set the tone of what these characters are in for, maybe what they've sort of been through. Um, and so with that opening line, you're right away getting that, well, first of all, that, that this character was named after this woman who was brutally murdered and, and that she learned about it at four years old. So you know right away, she did not have a normal upbringing and right. it was pretty disturbing. Um, and also it gets that part where she says, I assume one that a knife one day would carve me up. It kind of gets at that aspect of Dahlia I was talking about before that she doesn't trust anybody and that, um, the only person she trusted was her brother. So I tried to pack that all in. Um, and also, you know, she gets really intricate narrating that image of the black Dahlia, because that's something that has been sort of ingrained into her throughout her life. So yeah, so with the opening, I am telling a reader this is going to be dark, this is going to be weird, um, this is going to be pretty unsettling, but if those are your things, like, let's go. Pull up your big girl pants, let's rock this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Besides, uh, on a lighter note, only because uh, I think it's, I'm going to go back to your dog because I'm such a dog lover. Besides yeah. having Maisie by your side, that beautiful pup, while writing, what other traditions do you employ when writing? So lately, I've been really like setting the tone for my writing day by I, I light a candle, which I never used to do before. I was always like, eh, candles, whatever. But then I somebody gave me a candle and I was like, oh, it smells nice. And then I just started burning it while I was writing. And I was like, okay, this is signaling to me now that this is writing time. Another thing that I do to kind of like set myself up is I set a word count goal for the day. And normally what I do is keep it really, really reasonable, um, which usually for me is like 500 words, because for the most part, I can usually exceed that. So then if I exceed that, I feel like a rock star. Like I, I was amazing because I beat my goal for the day, even if the goal like wasn't that strenuous to begin with. This is one thing I always encourage my other writer friends who are trying to get into that habit is you have to you have to do this. You have to say to your family members, when I close that door or as my sister does, she has this little um, gnome like you'd see in yards mm -hmm. and you've seen in TV commercials. She has a gnome that she places outside her door. So yeah. that uh, anyone else in the house and they see the gnome, there's no coming in. I don't care unless the house is on fire. <laughs> and I find that to be true. And if you're not turning off your phone, silence or uh, airplane mode or what otherwise, and, and you don't set that precedent for yourself, how can you expect anyone else to respect that? Right. Yeah. The it's person just, who doesn't respect that is my dog. She'll nudge her way in to the door. She'll see that it's closed and she has this way. I don't know how, but she's able to kind of open the door and her head will just pop in and she'll look at me and I'll be like, okay, you can come in. 
but she won't. She'll just turn away. And I'm like, well, thanks. Now my door is just open. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm somebody who I need things to be quiet. I know a lot of people write to music um, and I can't really do that. I need to, I can't have like competing words around me. Um, I guess maybe I could to just like, like a score or something, but I've never really tried that. Um, and yeah, I got to be kind of in the same place the same day. And it's all about like just triggering that habit every day. Did you get a copy of my notes? Cause you're reading my very next question. <laughs> Is it music in the background or silence? And it's funny cause uh, I would say it's 50, 50 with the people I talk to 50% yeah. like music uh, of those people who like music. They tend to, you mentioned the word score, score or classical or jazz, but nothing with words or yeah. they like complete silence. Yeah, I mean, I have some friends who will build like entire playlists that are <laughs> music with lyrics that the lyrics kind of resonate with what they're writing and will kind of get them hyped up to write it. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I couldn't do that because I feel like that would start to infiltrate my words and it would be like if the song was saying the word rabbit for some reason over and over, then there'd be rabbits in my story and that's what would happen. <laughs> but. <laughs> Last week, I think it was last week, Meg Gardner was on the show and she was talking about, if you haven't had a chance to see that, that's a good one. Uh, she likes it complete silence because she doesn't want any competition for her characters. But here's an interesting point. And she and I share this and we were talking about, oh, she, I go, do you use Spotify? She goes, no, I use Amazon Music. I'm like, oh, I use Spotify to build my music score list because we both share this. When it's editing time or you want to punch up a scene, I think her favorite was Gladiator. Oh. And, yeah, and mine was any of the Bourne stories. <laughs> and are you pen, paper, or keyboard? Definitely keyboard, because I think my thoughts come out faster than my hands can write them. And I do a lot of editing while writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like constantly going up, back up a paragraph and changing that. And then like just tooling with it all the time. Awesome. As we start to wrap things up, I got three questions I like to throw at a lot of my authors, and you're going to be great at this. So the Thriller Zone is hosting a suave dinner party. And let's say you get to invite two or three people that you'd love to, to meet, whether it's dead or alive. Who would they be here at the dinner party? We're serving fabulous food, fabulous drinks. You and your husband and two or three of your favorite. Who would that be? I think Tom Hanks would be a very uh, soothing, comforting person to have around the table. He'd be funny. We could talk about typewriters and yeah. um, and he'd just have a lot of great stories. Um, I'm going to say Toni Morrison because like I said, she's one yeah. of my huge influences. I would probably immediately like shut down as a human because I would be like, I am in the presence of such greatness. I Nothing I say could be worth your time. So you just have your meal and I'll be over here. Um, and uh, Michelle Obama, because I love her. Oh, awesome. <laughs> you know, that's funny that you would say that. And we all, I think we all do that. And I bet you if you ask Toni Morrison or Tom Hanks the same question, they may go, what have I got to say to dinner party? You know, Megan's got a lot more interesting stories to tell, isn't it? <laughs> go ahead and live with that for a second. <laughs> I think it's interesting that we do that. And I think we shortchange ourselves because um, we put them in some kind of a spotlight that they they certainly deserve it as far as accolades of their talents. But they may say, man, I'd love to hear what Megan has to say about this. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure it's so different on the inside than it is on the outside because they're all still just people. Exactly. And they all have the same human needs and problems uh, that we all have. Maybe not the same problems if you're like really, really rich. Here's number two. Super easy. You're going to take okay. a long trip. You have one book to read and you have one CD to listen to. Let's pretend you still had a Walkman CD player. I think I would take Night Film by Marisha Pessel, which is one of uh, my all-time favorite books. It's, it's like 500 pages long, but it, it only took me like two days to read it. I could not stop reading it. You know, you hear people say like those can't eat, can't sleep type of books, but like, this is really, I think I skipped lunch while I was reading this book, which like, I'm always someone who's like, when's my next meal? I'm, I'm hungry. I want to eat again. Um, but that book is the most compelling, immersive, thrilling, chilling, all the things book. And it's nice and long. So it would help me along in that journey. Um, and for a CD, I think I would take 
definitely a Fiona Apple CD because she's amazing and I love her. And she's also very, her lyrics are really inspiring. So it would keep me in kind of a place of if I wanted to start writing or whatever, I might be able to hop into that. Excellent. So maybe um, her album, Extraordinary Machine, because I think that's my favorite one. All right, last question. What's the best piece of advice you could offer aspiring writers? Whenever I get a question like this, I say the same thing and it seems really, really simple, but it's actually really hard, um, which is to just keep going and keep pushing and keep writing. It seems simple because if you want to be a writer, you're like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to keep writing. But when you, if you're a writer whose goal or dream is to be published, you then come across the inevitable rejections. And it, you know, no matter who you are, no matter how great your story is, you're going to have those rejections and it's really hard and it can be demoralizing and it's disappointing and it's this whole roller coaster. And people would always say to me, like when I was trying to get an agent and then when I was trying to um, get a publisher, um, they would say, you know, it only takes one yes. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know, uh, but right now it's just a lot of no's. But, you know, now that I'm on the other side of it, I can say it, it's true. It really is just that one yes. Um, and there's going to be a lot of no's. Um, and I would also say, I think sort of related to that aspect of just the kind of brutalness of the industry, if you can find a way to separate what you're doing in terms of why you love writing and the purpose that you're that the drive that you have for it the reason you go back to your computer or your notebook or whatever it is the reason you open up your documents and separate that from all the outside stuff reviews rejections sales all of that all the stuff that's sort of in the business of publishing if you can try to keep in the forefront of your mind like that thing about why am i doing this why why is this important to me um, because those other things are something you will never have control over. And the only thing you can have control over is the work that you do every day. Um, and so I think, you know, when you first start publishing books, it's really hard to see those things kind of come together and, and, and the outside things are starting to impact the inside things. And you really got to remember the outside things are only happening because of the inside things, because you started writing and, and you made this thing. And so you can make all of these things and whatever happens on the outside, like good or bad, it, it says nothing about what you're doing. Cause there's a reason that you do this. <laughs> you know what? That is probably one of the most eloquent answers I've heard that, that really hits home. That really makes you stop and go. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Before we wrap, I want to read real quickly in case any of my viewers or listeners need some extra loving <laughs> for the family plot. Kathleen Barber says, gorgeously wrought and deliciously creepy. Andrea Bart says, mixes brilliant modern touches with timeless, eerie details. PJ Vernon, some of the best quotes ever, says, a gothic edge so sharp it's practically a switchblade. Samantha Bailey, one of the most original, twisted, genius storylines I've ever read. I, got, I had some really generous people reading this book. <laughs> and one more, a true crime meets house of horrors. Thank you, Vanessa Lilly. The book is The Family Plot. Megan Collins, you have been delightful. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. Thank you. A lot of fun. And thank you for taking me on this journey because uh, it I can literally say that the characters have haunted me for days since. Wow. Thank you so much. That's such I that is wonderful to hear. And I hope one day when you're humongous, like even bigger than you already <laughs> are, you'll come back to the thriller I'd zone. I'd love to. Love to. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. Absolutely. All right, you're probably wondering who's on the next Thriller Zone, right? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm stoked to welcome a very talented man who knows a good bit about living on life's razor's edge. Please join me as I welcome New York Times bestselling author Don Bentley. Don's been an Army Apache helicopter pilot in Afghanistan, a SWAT team member, and an FBI special agent. Don's also the author of Without Sanction and The Outside Man, as well as the Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan Jr. novel, Target Acquired. 
He's a busy guy. When you and I sit down with Don, we'll talk books, choppers, and if you know anything about Don, I'm sure we'll also enjoy more than a few laughs. So please make plans to listen on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join me, David Temple, for the next episode of The Thriller Zone.